Welcome to the Science for the Public lecture series. Science for the Public is an organization committed to bringing science information and issues to the general public. Visit our website for our program listings and blog. Good evening, I'm Yvonne Stapp and I welcome you to Contemporary Science, Issues and Innovations. Tonight we visit the internal world of the cell with a focus on one of the most enduring mysteries in biology, how in a group of identical cells does just one of them and only one switch on a particular gene. Learning what triggers this decision will provide insight into some of the biggest questions in biology, ranging from the definition of life to the mechanisms of disease. One of the leaders in that research is Yane Kandev, professor and chair of the Biological Physics Program at Brandeis University and co-director of the Brandeis Program in Quantitative Biology. It's our great pleasure to welcome him here tonight. Dr. Kandev grew up in the former Yugoslavia and received his bachelor's in science and physics at the University of Belgrade. He moved to the United States and received his PhD in physics at Cornell University in 1995. He then became a postdoctoral fellow at phys in physics at Brown University and then a member of the School of Mathematics at the Princeton U University Institute for Advanced Study and then a lecturer in physics at Princeton before joining the physics department at Brandeis University in 2000. Dr. Kandev has received re recognition for both his research and teaching, including an NSF Career Award and the Cottrell Scholar Award. He was also a 2007-2008 fellow at the Radcliffe Institute for Advanced Study. Professor Kondev's expertise in the bio, is the biophysics of the cell, and he brings to this study of how, study, uh, how cells switch on genes a mathematical framework that has greatly improved both the experimental work and the analysis of very complex data. We will hear tonight why this approach is necessary for probing the mechanisms of the cell and also what Professor Kondev and his colleagues have discovered that is leading to a real understanding of a fundamental cellular process. We appreciate Dr. Kondev's willingness to explain this very significant work to the general public and it is a real honor to welcome him here tonight. Dr. Kondev, welcome. Thank you, Yvonne. Today I would like to tell you about cells, um, and in particular how cells make decisions about uh, what to become. And in order to do that, I will first have to give you a little bit of a background. I'll give you a 10-minute crash course in molecular biology, and then I'll try to sort of weave into that uh, some very fundamental ideas about that come from physics, actually, that are quite old. In fact, they go back to some of the uh, actually most cited work of Einstein, and it's not E equals MC squared, but we'll get there. So uh, thinking about cells, uh, these are the basic units of life. They come in all sorts of shapes and sizes, and today most of the time I will be talking about a particular cell, which is this one. It's called an E. coli cell. This cell lives in our gut. There's about a kilo, uh, is that two pounds of E. coli? In, in each one, in, in our stomach, roughly speaking. And in fact, these cells are so small that there's about 10 times uh, more E. coli in our body than our own cells, which makes you think uh, uh, a little bit about uh, what our role in, in, in this uh, universe is. Uh, essentially, we're uh, you know, a small uh, uh, place for which uh, these E. coli cells inhabit. Uh, so, um, but when we think about cells, uh, the first thing we want to uh, address when we think when getting to this question of how cells make decisions is what is inside cells. So if we look at one of our E. coli cells, and this little picture is supposed to explain to you how big they are, uh, this is actually a point of a needle. So this and these yellow little uh, markings here, those are actual E. coli cells. Uh, e. coli cells, uh, their size is about a few micrometers, and a micrometer is one millionth of a meter. And this picture then tells you how many uh, uh, e. coli cells you can fit on a tip of a needle. Um, inside E. coli are various kinds of molecules. They're very tightly packed um, and in particular the two types of molecules that are 
essential uh, for the life of E. coli, and that I'll spend most of my time talking about are DNA, which I believe most people have heard of. Uh, that's uh, the molecule that carries genetic information. And then proteins. Proteins are molecules that are not as well known. They don't uh, get uh, as much coverage in, in the press, uh, but they're really important because they're the ones that determine essentially what cells do. They determine their function. And uh, how is it that they do that? Well, these proteins, they're essentially, you should think of them inside, their function inside cells, you should think of them as little machines. How little? Uh, they're nanometers in scale. A nanometer is one billionth of a meter. And just uh, for those of you who didn't grow up in the metric system, a meter is about that big. So take this length and divide it into billion pieces. That's the size of one of these machines. And what do these protein machines do in the cell? They accomplish a number of different tasks. They transport molecules from one compartment of the cell to another. They produce other proteins. And uh, the, pr the machine that does that is called the ribosome. And uh, they also make fuel. And uh, here's a couple of little videos uh, that were made recently at Harvard that sort of summarize uh, the, uh, a lot of knowledge that's been gained over the last 50 or so years about the workings of some of these proteins. So what you see here, uh, these are protein tracks. These are literally railroad tracks on which, as you'll see in a second, uh, cargo is being transported through the cell. What's interesting about these tracks, unlike the railroad tracks, that we use for transport is these tracks are constantly being assembled and disassembled. There you saw a little disassembly. Here's an assembly of a different kind of railroad track, which actually has the shape of a hollow tube. And here, that railroad track is disassembling. And now this is just uh, amazing. This, this blows my mind every time I've seen it. So this is a single molecule. And what that molecule is doing, it's literally walking along one of these tracks. It's making eight nanometer steps and carrying a cargo, the big round thing you saw on top of this molecule, and I can sort of rewind this a little bit, the big round thing you saw on top of this molecule was, here's the molecule again, uh, it's got two legs, it walks along this uh, track, which is called a microtubule, and it carries this big, uh, this big sack, this sack is made of lipids, and inside that sack are various other molecules, proteins, that the cell needs to transport from one part to the other part for some particular function. And so what's really Im incredible, and this is something that's only emerged in the last 20 or so years, is that the cell is not this sort of mixed, uh, it's not a bag of chemicals where these chemicals are just kind of freely floating around and interacting with each other. It's actually a collection of machines. And these machines are made of proteins, and they do very specific things, like this machine transports cargo. There's another machine. Uh, I have a little movie of that one here. This one is really amazing because what that machine does, it actually produces uh, energy for the cell. It works like a turbine. So at the beginning of the movie, and you can see right here, I'll stop it for a second, you see this little piece of the machine, the little piece of the protein is rotating. The reason it's rotating is there's literally not water, but ions rushing through, just like a hydroelectric power plant where the water slides down from a higher to a lower place, and thereby, when it does that, it turns a turbine. Turbine. Similarly, inside the cell, there's a protein that runs in the same way. And as a product, it does not make electrical energy, but it makes chemical energy in the form of molecules called ATPs. And these are molecules that we and all living organisms use as the source of energy. So, uh, so again, this is an example of one such protein machine. And these little these bright yellow uh, dots that you see flying off, these are these ATP molecules, the molecules of energy that the machine makes. So there are cells. Inside these cells, there are various protein machines. And it's the workings of these machines that give cells uh, their, uh, their particular properties. It's the workings of these machines that make nerve cells do the stuff that nerve cells do. For instance, you know, in, our, in our organisms, they make up our brains. It's these machines that inside red blood cells make red blood cells do what they do, which is transport oxygen from our lungs to the rest of our body. So it's the presence of these machines that gives the cells, essentially, their ability to perform different functions in, in our bodies and in other organisms.
Okay. And what do cells do? Well, they do a lot of different things. They move around. Like I said, here's a little movie. Uh, I love showing this movie because what it shows, this is a white blood cell. And here is a little bacterium cell. And this white blood cell is going to try and essentially track, or that's what it does, it tracks this bacterial cell. So it, it's chasing it because the bacterial cell is an intruder. And what this white blood cell is trying to do is try to chase it down. It will eventually engulf it and digest it. And this is actually what you see here is at the single cell level the workings of our immune system. So they move around. Cells can be social. Here's a collection of dictostelium cells. These are single-celled organisms. So each one of these cells is, a, is an organism in itself. But when it senses trouble, this dictostelium cells, they all band up and they form a structure that looks like a little worm that allows it to get uh, much, in a much more efficient way, away from danger. So this is something that cells can do. Uh, the most sort of, uh, the, one of the simplest things, things that cells do, and something that we still don't fully understand, is the fact that they divide. So here again is one of these E. coli cells, and what you'll see is that it'll form a little septum in the middle, and it will break into two cells. So this is a process by which one cell becomes two cells. And finally, uh, in this little movie, uh, which comes out of a lab here, Sunny G's lab here at Harvard, or just down the street, what you can see is again an E. coli cell dividing. This movie keeps looping around, so I have to show you, and we'll spend a lot of time talking about this movie because it's the, it's the sort of at the heart of what I want to talk about today. But what's going on in this movie is, uh, let me get, okay, so now here it's starting. The cell divides, and then what you see is that one of these two daughter cells lights up yellow, while the other one does not. Does everyone see that, right? Uh, so what you're observing there is at the single cell level, one of the E. coli cells, one of these daughter cells, deciding to not produce the yellow protein. What the scientists have done here is they've labeled the protein yellow so that you can see it. And, what you, and now what's happening is that one of the daughter cells is making the yellow protein and the other daughter cell is not. And this is really strange and puzzling. Why? Because these two cells have the exact same DNA. What happened is you started with a mother cell. The mother cell has DNA. That DNA got replicated. It got split into these two cells. And now these two daughter cells have the exact same DNA. And they live in the exact same environment. So, in sort of popular press, we usually talk about certain traits as being either genetic or determined by the environment. What's going on here is the trait, the trait here being the cell producing the yellow protein, is neither determined by the environment nor by genetics. Those are identical for those two cells. It's being determined by chance. It's as if, though, these cells have a free will. They can essentially decide whether they're going to produce the yellow protein or not. And that is something that's become a very, very sort of uh, big topic in my field of research right now, trying to understand how is it that these decisions, in this case to produce the yellow protein or not, how is it that these decisions are made in a random fashion? And what does that imply about cellular life? And therefore, what does that imply about uh, certain uh, processes that are associated with disease. And this is what I would like to get to today. So, uh, oh, by the way, another thing that's really mysterious, I can't help but, but point that out, you could have seen that in this movie again, is that when the movie starts, note when the cell divides, it divides right in the middle. And this is something I always tell my students, how the heck does the cell know where its middle is? That is actually something that we still don't really understand. And you can ask, well, how precisely does the cell divide in the middle? It's plus minus 5% of its length. It's very precise. But you, know, but you have to understand, there isn't like a little engineer with a, with a ruler in the cell measuring this length and saying, aha, here's the middle, divide there. Somehow the cell has to figure this out. It doesn't have a brain. How does it do that? It's a very interesting trick. And we kind of know some parts of how it does this little magic trick, but we don't still fully understand it. So even something as simple as the division of a cell is not something we fully understand. OK, so why is this decision making important? Or what it, in which context is this decision making important? In many different contexts. But the one that you, might, might, you are going to be very familiar with is in the context of development. All you have to think about is that each one of us started as a single cell, a single uh, cell. And that cell divides, divides, divides. And as it divides, 
you have more cells. Right now in my body, there's about 10 to the 14th cell, so one with 14 zeros. But all those cells started from a single cell. How is it that even though all these cells have the same genetic information, some cells are nerve cells, like in my brain, some are muscle cells, actually this would be, uh, uh, these, this, what I'm pointing to of course is, is, my, is my skin cells, uh, of course they're reproductive cells, various kinds of blood cells. Okay? So this process is called differentiation. The word doesn't matter, you can call it whatever you want, but the mystery is, is very sort of palpable. The idea is all of these cells are very, very different. They perform very different functions, yet they all come from the original cell, the egg cell, that, uh, that uh, was fertilized at the, at the moment of conception. So uh, in order to produce this diversity of cells, Cells have to make decisions, and they have to make different kinds of decisions all the time. So how do they do that? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to walk you through uh, this decision-making process inside that happens in cells that all cells uh, have to that all cells do. Uh, but I'd like to explain to you what is this? How does this decision-making process look at the? molecular scale, at the scale of individual protein molecules and DNA molecules. <clears throat> so in order to do that, I will first, first uh, I will sort of try to describe for you the, the machines. I told you that the cell is a collection of machines. Well, there are machines inside the cell that produce, uh, that produce uh, proteins, and these are the critical machines for this question of cell decision making. Why? Because you see what's going on is that these cells are different because they contain different proteins. Okay? So let me step back for a second. Our DNA contains the blueprints for all the different proteins that are necessary to produce all the different kinds of cells. So if I took a red blood cell, in the DNA, the DNA of the red blood cell is exactly the same as the DNA of a nerve cell. Yet, the proteins that are produced in the red blood cell is a subset of all the proteins that the DNA codes, and it's a different subset from the subset produced in the nerve cell. That's what makes the red blood cell different from the nerve cell. Okay? So at the heart, this tells you that at the heart of this process of deciding whether you're going to be a nerve cell or a blood cell, at the heart of that process has to be the molecular process which turns, which makes proteins from DNA. Okay? And that process is called gene expression. And so how does this work? Well, here's DNA, and it's a long molecule. It consists of these bases. You've probably heard A, C, T, G. Depending on what the order of these bases is, you get the DNA code. And that particular order of these bases tells you which protein is coded up by the piece of the DNA. And the piece of the DNA that codes for a protein is about a thousand of these letters. So in the English language, words are typically 10 to, 20, 10 to 20 letters long. In the language of life, words are about thousand letters long. A thousand bases of DNA makes a word where by word I mean a protein. Okay? So there's first a machine that reads the DNA and makes a messenger RNA molecule. That molecule has the exact same information as the DNA molecule, but it's one that can be read by a translating machine called the ribosome. And the ribosome reads the information on the RNA and produces the protein, which is a string of amino acids. The way it does that is it identifies one amino acid with three bases of DNA. Okay? So three letters of the genetic code tell you which amino acid they correspond to, and then once, and then e so then you go three by three by three, and each, that, each set of three letters produce, gives you an amino acid, and those amino acids are strung together like beads on a, on a, on a, on a string, and that is the protein. Okay? How do you get that complicated machine? Well, all these amino acids that are all strung together, they kind of fold up by themselves, which is amazing. They fold up inside the cell and they fold up into one of these you know, amazing machines that I talked to you, that I told you about earlier. So how does this work? Well, here's again a little movie. So uh, this uh, machine called the RNA polymerase, it just binds to the DNA and then it zips down the DNA. As it's zipping down the DNA, it's reading the information on the DNA 
And as it's doing that, it's producing a new molecule, which is this yellow thing that's being pushed out, and that's the messenger RNA. You'll see the messenger RNA more clearly as the, as the, as the uh, polymerase here uh, moves, uh, uh, moves along the DNA. So the, it's reading the DNA, and it's making this transcript, the messenger RNA. In this next movie, you'll see this messenger RNA then gets read by a separate machine called the ribosome. That ribosome assembles on the messenger RNA, and then once it's assembled, it starts reading the messenger RNA. It's like a ticker tape. It sends the messenger RNA, messenger RNA through, the, uh, through the machine. And as it does that, slowly but surely, there will be a little protein that's being excreted by the other end. What the movie shows here are molecules that carry the individual amino acids, that carry the individual amino acids to the ribosome. So this is a v really kind of this orchestrated process of, uh, of, of uh, taking the DNA code and turning it into, uh, turning it into a protein. And so uh, uh, if I move a little further, what we'll see here is the protein, this little red, uh, uh, this little red uh, sort of molecule coming out uh, one end. Uh, and that's essentially this, uh, this uh, set of amino acids. So uh, going back to the question that I started with, how does a cell make decisions? Or what is at the molecular, what's the molecular basis of, of cellular decision making? The molecular basis of cellular decision making is deciding which of these genes to turn into proteins. So on the DNA, on our DNA, there's about 20,000 genes. In the red blood cell, not all 20,000 genes are made into proteins, only a certain subset. A cell makes a decision by deciding which subset to express which subset of genes to read and then turn into proteins. How does the cell do that? This was described uh, now about 50 or so years ago. And the most simple process by which the cell does that is simply by turning genes on and off. Okay? That seems kind of obvious. If it, the gene is not being expressed, so here's some stretch of the DNA, that's a gene. And if that gene is not being read by the polymerase, that means the gene is off. In other words, the protein that's encoded by this gene is not being produced in the cell. Okay? So how can that be accomplished? How can the cell accomplish this feat and tell and sort of and make sure that this gene is not produced. Well, here's the trick, one trick that cells use. What they do is they end up having on the DNA a little region of that DNA which binds. So that region acts like Velcro. That when we say binds, we mean it's like it, it has the properties like of Velcro. It's not really Velcro, but that's a good sort of uh, thing to have in your head. Uh, and that Velcro makes a protein, another protein, stick to it. Now, the thing is, if that protein, which is called here repressor, sticks to it, well, what does that do? Well, that protein then is taking up the space that this guy would like to occupy. So this protein, by sticking to the DNA, makes it so that this machine, the RNA polymerase, the one that zips along DNA and makes the messenger RNA, makes it so that that machine cannot bind to the DNA. And therefore, that turns the gene off. OK? And so this, and there's other sort of more sophisticated mechanisms, but this is the simplest one. If the, this blue protein with two legs called a repressor, it actually looks like that. It looks sort of kind of like it has a couple of legs. It doesn't walk around on these legs. These legs are just sort of, you can think of it more like as a, as a lunar landing module. It just kind of lands in the DNA. It sticks there. The gene is turned off. So either the gene is off when the repressor protein is bound to the DNA, or when the repressor protein is not bound, then the gene is on. Okay. <clears throat> but, okay, the point is, and this is, this is sort of now getting into this, uh, what I really, you know, this is all sort of biology background. So this is, you know, not, uh, this, not to make anyone feel bad, but this is the stuff we teach people in high school these days. Uh, I never learned it in high school because I never paid attention in biology. In fact, I don't think they taught us that in biology. I think they taught us different ways of classifying plants and animals, if I remember correctly. Uh, but uh, but uh, this is sort of hard one, sort of, I, these, these are ideas that have been hard won in the sense in the last sort of 30 or 40 years of research, which is probably why I didn't learn it in high school. Uh, we've come to this sort of very simple, basic understanding of what it means to turn genes on and off. But the way I've described this process for you, right, these movies that I've showed you, they make this look 
like a very regular process, right? There's the DNA. I, you know, here's the, there's the DNA. I'm going to disconnect something. There's the DNA, right? This polymerase binds to it. And then it moves along the DNA, producing this messenger RNA. And by producing this messenger RNA and then protein, it essentially makes the cell behave in a certain way because now that cell has that particular protein. How is it then, then that this process leads to random decision making, right? So that's what I want to explain. Again, here is an example, a beautiful example of a random decision being made where an E. coli cell, initially not expressing the yellow protein, divides into two cells and then these two daughter cells express different proteins. These are genetically identical, they're identical twins, if you like, in identical environments, right? It's like if you had, you know, twin girls and one decided to join a rock band and the other one decided to become a scientist, right? And, and you can't understand what is it that, that happened with the scientist, right? Because uh, it just is inconceivable because they were, you know, raised under the exact same circumstances and they have the, well, they don't have the same genes when it's in, in our case because they could have inherited different genes from mother and father. So, of course, you always blame the father for, 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 the, for the stuff that went wrong. But nonetheless, the point here is that the genes in these two cells are completely identical, okay? Modulo there being some mutation, but that happens so rarely that we can kind of more or less be guaranteed that it didn't happen here. So how can, the f how can these two genetically identical cells produce very different outcomes? Uh, and that's what I want to talk about. Uh, that's what I want to spend some of my time talking about. And to explain that, now I will have to tell you a little bit about physics. So um, the subject that I'm excited about is called biophysics. And what it does is it kind of looks at biological phenomena and it identifies biological phenomena that look weird. And then it asks the question, well, can we understand that weirdness? Is there something in physics that can help us understand that weirdness? Okay, That's sort of one way to define it. Maybe not the most uh, scientific way, but I think it works. So the physics that describes this weirdness is the physics of diffusion or Brownian motion. So what is Brownian motion? Well, I, th I thought one way to uh, describe it and also allowed me to play over the weekend with a new iPad app that allows you to make uh, uh, animations as you'll see. These are, these are my animations which is why they're so uh, weird looking. But what I want to do is explain to you uh, the physics of diffusion by thinking about billiards. Okay? So most of us have played billiards or know what billiards are. So you have a table and these edges, they make the ball bounce off. And the thing about billiards is that if you set a ball flying in one direction, the motion of that ball is completely predictable, right? So it keeps bouncing off the walls of the billiard table and just moves around. And this is well, de well described by, uh, by sort of equations of motion that were handed, us, uh, handed to us down by, by almighty Newton. Okay, so, so that, that we, that's sort of very predictable macroscopic motion. And so let, I want to contrast, uh, contrast with that what, happens, what would happen if I made this billiard the size of a cell. So imagine that I shrink the billiard all the way down to the size of the cell, which means I shrink it down by a factor of a million. Now I have the cells playing billiards. Okay? So this little billiard ball is going to be the size is going to be the size of one of those, uh, one of those uh, bags that, that that molecule was carrying around. Okay? And by the way, when I show that movie of the molecule that carried the bag around, remember? That movie, movie made it seem like the whole thing was very regular. The molecule just kept walking down this, down this track. That's one thing that's actually not quite right in the movie. The walking is going to be random. Why is it random? Because if I, have, if I were to make a billiard table the size of a cell and I were to set this little ball, in this case it would be like a protein, in motion, its motion would not be predictable. It would look like this. It would just be randomly moving in different directions, changing directions all the time. That kind of motion is called Brownian motion. A, a British botanist in the early 19th century observed this motion when he looked at, uh, looked at sort of microbes. Well, it wasn't microbes. There were pollen sort of uh, seeds under the microscope. And he saw this motion and he, th he thought the thing must be alive. Because when you see something like this, you can't imagine that this sort of motion has, is an inanimate thing. It looks like it might be swimming around and doing something interesting, something that's not uh, associated with non-living matter. But uh, that's not the case. This is actually something that uh, 
will happen uh, if you just have a very, very small object, the size, let's say, of a cell. And uh, this was really explained in 1905 by none other than Albert Einstein, in fact. So in 1905, Einstein wrote three papers. He wrote the paper that described this process of diffusion. He wrote the paper on relativity, which explained that the speed of light, or started from the idea that the speed of light is the maximum speed that you could achieve in the universe. That's where E, e equals mc squared came from. And then the third paper he wrote essentially founded quantum mechanics. So that was a really good year for Einstein. What's interesting is that actually what he's most known about, of course, is E equals mc squared. But the paper that has had the most influence, at least by the number of citations, number of scientists who've been affected by, by his work, is this paper that most people don't know about. And that's the paper on diffusion. And what Einstein explained there was, 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 uh, was, the, this, was this observation that was made by, by uh, Brown of this random motion. And what did he realize? He realized that this random motion of these, of these beads, what you see here is literally a movie of micron-sized beads. So these are beads that are one millionth the size of a meter. And these beads are moving around randomly. The reason they're moving around randomly is very simple, actually. It's because they're constantly being bombarded by water molecules, showed in my animation as blue. So what we have to remember is that there's tiny water molecules around these beads. Those water molecules are in constant thermal agitation and motion. And what they're doing all the time, and this is happening to me as well as I'm standing here, I'm being bombarded by molecules of air around me. The reason I'm not bouncing all over the place is that I'm very big. And so those collisions do not make me fly off one way or the other. But if you're small, the collisions with these water molecules will make you jiggle around. And that's the Brownian motion. OK, so I said that, uh, so now we have Brownian motion. Now we have this idea that proteins, which are uh, even smaller than these guys, so you know these protein machines, which are the, you know, smaller than these uh, cells, we have this idea that their motion is irregular, that they're constantly jiggling around. Well, what does that have to do with expression of genes and cellular decision making? OK, well, another little uh, diagram. So what I explained, another little movie. This one was hard to make. Uh, so uh, I explained here uh, just a while ago that the way genes are turned on and off is you have these proteins that bind here. Now it's shown here. And, the re and this protein now does not let the polymerase bind here. This polymerase needs to bind here to read the gene. So let's see what happens. And now we have to remember that the motion of all these guys, this guy and this guy and this guy, but I won't represent this is the DNA, the bar. I won't show its Brownian motion. They're all undergoing Brownian motion. So the process of binding kind of looks like this. this guy, they're all bouncing around. This guy's trying to get there. He can't. But at some point, this guy goes away. And then this guy binds. And once it binds here, it can read the gene. OK, did everyone see that? So always there's this dance going around. There's no purpose to the dance. These things are jiggling out around at random. But by random chance, at some point, this guy will bind here. What does that mean? That means if I repeated, well, not this movie, because I'm showing the same movie. But if I repeated this process, if I watched this process over and over again, the time when this binds would be completely random. It would be completely unpredictable. right? And by binding here, I am starting to make a protein. So in fact, what can happen is, in the life of the cell, just by random chance, this guy might never, might never actually leave. Just by random chance, uh, this guy might just never leave, in which case the gene doesn't get expressed. In another cell, this guy might pop off by random chance very quickly, and the gene gets expressed. And voila, then you have one cell that's expressing the gene, and the other it's not. Very simple. And what recent research has shown is that this is really at the heart this is the process that makes different cells express genes differently. That even though two cells are genetically identical, they can express different proteins simply because of this little random dance that happens all the time at the molecular scale. And uh, we can watch this molecular dance these days, actually, uh, uh, explicitly by labeling the different proteins. So here's the RNA polymerase again. We can label it with uh, a fluorescent molecule. So we can watch it in a fluorescence microscope. And we can label the DNA. And what you kind of see in this movie are little red, uh, little red uh, squares. You can fixate your view on one red square. And what you'll see is that sometimes in the red squares, there's a little blip of light, right? And all, I wanted to, and so all I'm going to tell you is that when you see a blip of light, that's one of these guys binding. 
and then the blip of light disappears, it's falling off. And if you look, you'll see they're kind of blipping in and out all the time. That is us, the scientists in this case, in this case my friend Jeff Gellis, who uh, does these kinds of experiments at Brandeis University. It's Jeff seeing individual molecules. Each one of these blips is an individual molecule falling on the DNA, falling off the DNA. And each one of these processes of it falling on the DNA will, in the cell, be accompanied by the production of a protein. So this give, should give you an idea how the production of proteins inside cells is random. And it's random because of Brownian motion. We can also see this production and its randomness by actually labeling the, the molecules that are being produced. So this is a study that was done at Princeton a few years back. And here you again see, you see our friends, the E. coli cells. And what you'll see here are little green dots. I apologize if it doesn't come out very well. These green dots are these RNA molecules that are made. They're made when the polymerase binds and then moves along the DNA. You make the RNA molecule. OK, so that in my little movie here, that happened towards the end. Uh, let's see if I can speed it up. So when the, when, the, when the polymerase binds, it starts making the RNA molecule. Remember, that's the thing that was shooting out of the uh, polymerase. So in this, experiment at, uh, in this experiment at Princeton, they were able to label, I purposely drew that green, because they were able to label those molecules with a green fluorescence. And so as it's being made, you can see the green come up. And then you can actually, by seeing those green dots come up, you can count how many molecules are being made in a single cell. And what this shows you is the production of those molecules in a single cell as a function of time. Look at this. It looks completely random. And that's the point. So molecules are being made. The reason that the number of molecules drops is because the cell divides. And some of the molecules go to one daughter cell. Others go to another cell. And how many go to one and the other is also completely random. If there's 10 molecules, well, it's most likely that it's 5-5, five, five, but it can be 6-4 or 3-7. And then you see, again, molecules are made. Nothing happens that you can think of that repressor being on the, on the DNA. Then it falls off. You make molecules. Nothing happens. You make molecules that divide. So the life of a cell in terms of the production of proteins is completely random, unpredictable, which does beg the question, how is it that we all end up with five fingers? Why don't we have 6, 7, 20 if it's all random? And that's actually a really tough question to answer. <clears throat> so in the last few minutes, what I'd like to tell you are some consequences of this randomness. And these consequences are really interesting. One of the consequences of this randomness is uh, the persistence of bacterial infections. This was something that was discovered actually almost 50 years ago in the case of tuberculosis. And what then the doctors realized, and they had no idea about what I just told you, but what they found is that patients would be treated against tuberculosis, and they would seem like they've gotten better. And after a while, they would get tuberculosis again. But here's the weird thing. The, often the explanation you hear, and that's not always, that's, that's actually sometimes true. I'm not saying this is not ever true. I'm, I'm not telling you don't, don't believe what you hear. But, but the, the standard explanation for this is that because you, you, you know, the bacteria, because the, you've been, you, too many people are have, you're taking antibiotics, the bacteria mutate and become resistant to antibiotics. That does happen. But here's the funny thing that happened 50 years ago with tuberculosis. They treated the patients, and then the Tuberculosis returned. When they treated the patient again, the tuberculosis went away. Now that's weird. Because if the bacteria mutated, how come they are still sensitive to, tuber to, to anti-tuberculosis drug? They should have mutated so that they're no longer sensitive to it. They're still as sensitive. And so this became, this is known as persistence. And this was a huge puzzle. And now we understand what's going on. What's going on is that in a population of cells, these are all genetically identical tuberculosis bacteria. In that population, there are some guys, the black ones shown here, which are by random chance producing proteins that make them resistant to the antibiotic. But here's the kicker. Those guys, they are, because they're spending, this is not quite how it happens, but it's, it's reasonably correct. Uh, this, it's a reasonably correct approximation. Because they're making these proteins, and make, which make them resistant to, to the anti-tuberculosis drugs, they are growing very slowly. So they're the slow pokes. In other words, they're not causing the infection. They're like a few cells, one in a few million, that are not really growing, but they're resistant. So what happens now? You treat the body with an anti-tuberculosis drug. You kill all these guys that have, that have caused you issues. But you did not kill these resistant guys. And these resistant guys then, by random chance again, can turn into these guys. 
And once they turn into the red guys, they take over your lungs again. So uh, another place where this happens, and this is now becoming quite exciting for a lot of people uh, because, well, to be honest, because there's lots of money in cancer research, uh, is that there's, starting, there's a, now an alternative hypothesis to what's going on with cancer. One of the things that's been known for a very long time, when you look at any cancerous tissue, is that the cancer cells in that tissue are very different. In other words, they express different genes, okay, as we've described here. And there's now a hypothesis that actually, within a cancer tissue, there's only a few cells, kind of like these black persister cells, that are responsible for the growth of the tumor. And so this idea then describes why sometimes you go in, you treat the patient, you treat him uh, or her with you know, chemotherapy or, or, or radiation therapy, and it seems like the cancer has gone away. But then you get remission. And often when you get remission, the cancer is even more uh, sort of, is e isn't spreading even faster. And so this hypothesis, that uh, this idea that in a population of cells, there are some that are very different and are very actually, and those, those that are very different uh, are small in number because what's special about those is they're super resistant. They're like Superman. They can resist any treatment, but because they can resist any tr treatment, they don't, they don't reproduce very well. I think that's also the case with bodybuilders, but I don't know. Anyway, so, uh, so this is kind of the, that, that concept. And, uh, and uh, this is uh, the so-called cancer stem cell hypothesis. And this is another reason why a lot of people are spending a lot of time trying to understand how is it that a cell can make these different decisions to produce different proteins to become the red or the black cells here, the persister or the non-persister. How is it that it can do that by random chance? And if indeed cancer cells are doing this by random chance, what, sh what, what kind of therapy should we be thinking about, because then if indeed the cancer is being caused or is the key to the cancer is only a few cells, then that tells you if you remove most of the cancers and you don't, cancer, you don't get those few cells, persister cells in the bacterial context, if you don't get those, you're not going to, you're, you're not, you're, you have not uh, helped the patient. In fact, you might have harmed the patient because those guys will then proliferate even faster. And uh, finally, uh, just to, uh, uh, maybe end on a more positive note because I've talked about tuberculosis and cancer and that's not going to make anyone feel very good. Uh, here's, a, here's the last slide is a feel good slide and that's something that we're trying to actively do uh, in this field using the knowledge that we're gaining about how cells make decisions and the thing we're trying to do is to engineer gene expression. In other words, We've come, we've come to the point now where we understand at the molecular scale how genes are turned on and off to that extent that we can actually make synthetic circuits. And those synthetic circuits, which means connecting different genes so that they produce novel chemicals, can be used in, can be used in, in medicine. So one of the, for instance, ideas a friend of mine here at MIT is pursuing is to introduce into E. coli cells a novel genetic circuit. And what this genetic circuit should do is it should when the E. coli is introduced in the human body, it should find a cancer cell and then destroy it. So the idea here is to re-engineer bacteria, these little organisms, so that they can actually do our bidding. In fact, one of the most successful uh, sort of, uh, one of the most successful uh, uh, developments in that regard is the production of insulin. It used to be that, all, that most insulin that was used, on, that humans used, was produced by uh, pigs. So, Pig insulin is very similar to human insulin, so you would ground up a lot of pig and, uh, and you'd try to extract insulin. It wasn't quite as good because it's not exactly the same. So what's going on now is that practically all the human insulin used is produced by bacteria. What people have figured out is how to make bacteria, re-engineer them, how to make them produce human insulin. So I'm going to stop here. What I hope to have described for you is that the molecular machines that determine cellular fates that determine how a cell behaves, operate in a random fashion. And because of that, so each cell is an individual, and this is really reformulating the way we think about living things, and it's also making us rethink very important things like therapeutics for diseases such as tuberculosis, and also re makes us rethink how to at attack cancer. And finally, I'd be remiss if I didn't say that science is, is very much uh, an enterprise, it includes many, many individuals, and these are some of the people that I work with, 
uh, colleagues of mine and then our various students who, of course, are the ones really uh, responsible for all these ideas. Thank you. I'm just wondering about, uh, you, you talked about uh, single cells and something within the single cells um, being random. And then you also ask the question that uh, how is it that you still have, say, everybody still has five fingers. But I think that's something that you then didn't address. So in this randomness, how is it that the reading of information is still not random? Are there any ideas about that? Or is that just still work in progress? Um, excellent question. So uh, um, there, uh, the short answer, it's work in progress. But uh, um, for instance, one of the things that's very exciting is that, and the process by which you know, we get these fingers and all that, this is the process of development, right? It's the idea that you start with a single cell, then you get many, many cells, and those cells differentiate. And that whole process is called development. And this development is, is in, this, in this developmental process, it's not single genes. What happens is there's a bunch of circuits that the genes are connected into, and that sort of eventually leads to uh, differentiation of body parts, et cetera, okay? So, what people have discovered recently, and I think this was a, a, a lab at MIT, is, for instance, they found one such circuit whose job was essentially to filter noise. So just like if you were trying to build a, a good stereo system, you actually would, into the electronics, build in something that would make the, the hummings, you know, be, you know, like in the old radios, it would always make those awful sounds. Well, uh, in order to do that, you, you build a little circuit that, 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 that actually filters out the noise. And it looks like through evolution, nature has figured that out in the context of genetic circuits, at least in this one, one case. I'm not saying that's always uh, going on, and, this, and I'm not even saying that that's why we have five fingers, but, but that's sort of one, one example where actually it was traced down, where, where the, the reduction of noise is. So, um, so, so generally people, you know, and, and I think that's generally true, usually for what cells are trying to do, noise is a bad thing. But uh, what's interesting is that actually bacterial cells use it in a good way to hedge bets, right? And so, uh, uh, so when it's bad, you'd like to filter it. How, it's, how it gets filtered is, 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 is a very interesting question. And there are some answers, but not all. But in terms of the seeming randomness, then is it possible that things, are look, ra things look random when, in fact, on a large scale, that they are not, and we just don't see it? And you have, I was thinking of that particular study. Mm. Yeah. So uh, uh, when we think, yeah, so, so you raise a very, very important question. When we think about randomness at the molecular scale, we can ask then why isn't everything in, in, in that we observe random, right? Because if everything under, you know, we're all made of atoms. Those atoms are behaving in random fashions. Why is it that, uh, why is it that I can reach out and pick this up and that's not random? That's, that's something I've just sort of done and I can do it over and over again. Uh, so. Uh, one of the sort of things we learned from physics is the reason that at the macroscopic scale you don't see this randomness is sort of, I can describe it very simply by co flip, flipping coins. So if you flip a coin once, uh, trying to guess whether you're going to get heads or tails, well, the chances are 50-50, right? So if you can guess uh, on a single flip, if you can guess every time, then you have, you know, magical powers, right? On the other hand, if I flip a coin a thousand times, I can tell you with great certainty that, that the number of heads I'm going to get is going to be 500 plus minus 10. The chances of getting 300 are non-existent. So as I increase the number of molecules, the randomness of each molecule washes out. And what's left at the macroscopic scale is very regular, very regular behavior. So, the reason this comes as a surprise is that we're macroscopic things. We are consisted of 10 to the 14 cells. What's happening at the single cell level in terms of its randomness seems like it should not affect us. But a single cell can produces us. A single cell makes the whole human being. So it's not so and a single cell starts the cancer process. And in that single cell, it's a single molecule, a, a single gene that's either turned on or off. And when it comes to that, this randomness is all important. It's all about the randomness. 
And this is a, this kind of wasn't appreciated, or I would say it was appreciated even back in the late 50s. I think what's really causing a huge sort of uh, uh, um, interest in this field right now is that now, today, we have the technical abilities to actually observe single cells and to observe expression of genes in single cells. And in large part, that's been enabled by the invention of a CCD camera. CCD cameras have, have revolutionized biology. I mean, they're very fancy. They cost like 20,000 bucks, but they're still CCD cameras, same concept. That and, and that and fluorescent molecules. The fact that in some uh, weird jellyfish, people found these molecules that just fluoresce in green, and now you can put those molecules any, almost anywhere you like in the cell, and then you can follow the thing you labeled in green in the cell. That was not around. Now it is, and now we, now we can actually address these, these questions. So my training was uh, exclusively in mathematics and physics. In fact, uh, I uh, really did not like biology or chemistry very much, and I avoided it at every possible step of my education. Uh, so uh, that left me a little bit of a, in, a, in, a bad in a bad position when I started doing research in biology. Um, the, most of the sort of uh, training that really made a difference in my, in, in, in my scientific career was uh, graduate work at, at Cornell, where there was a real emphasis on problem solving and being creative about science. That was probably the first time I, I came in contact with the idea that science is not just a system of facts that's once and for all written down, but is an evolving living thing. And to contribute to science means to actually do something novel, do something interesting, and not just regurgitate uh, things that one can find in books, which was more what I had done up till then. So uh, biophysics is a field that tries to combine physics and biology. What that means is it starts from the, uh, from the appreciation of the fact that at the molecular scale, um, life is really a set of physical phenomena since it really deals with the motion and interactions of molecules. And biophysics tries to start from there and uh, tries to describe those motions in terms of mathematics, which is what physics really does describe nature in terms of mathematics. And by doing so, it tries to make predictable theories of living systems. In other words, the idea would be to be able to predict the behavior of a cell if it's exposed to a particular chemical environment, something we still can't do. Uh, predictions, of course, are very hard to make, especially in science. One of the most exciting things about basic science is its in unpredictability. In fact, just today, a graduate student of mine showed me data which probably will send us flying into a completely new direction, which I hadn't envisioned until yesterday, or today, I should say. Uh, but having said that, I think one of the great challenges of biophysics today is trying to, trying to push the field into uh, the settler domain, something I will talk about today. Uh, so far, it's mostly had its successes by focusing on individual molecules, but uh, it seems like the time has come to actually address the behavior of whole cells with these ideas. So the most rewarding part of the work is definitely working with graduate students, uh, young people coming into the field, uh, trying to help them find their own way, trying to help them uh, become creative and uh, provide new ideas and build on what we've done so far in the sciences. And then, of course, sort of this uh, thing that happens some, once in a while, which is you go to work in the morning believing one thing and you come home, it turns out what you believed in was completely wrong. And that's certainly one of the great thrills of doing science. Most of the frustration tends to come from funding and trying to keep funding uh, for, uh, uh, for this kind of, for science in general. Uh, most of that funding really is for these young people, for the graduate students, the funding pays their salaries. So that makes it somewhat uh, also uh, difficult because it's not just simply if the money runs out, there won't be any more experiments, but if the money runs out, someone will be, someone, some, per, some young person will have to be told they can't do science anymore. And that's quite uh, frustrating. Uh, doesn't happen often, but it's starting to happen with, with the way the funding has been going recently. So I can say just something about teaching science. And I, I, when I teach science, I actually, going back to your first question, try to really sort of address the, in some ways, deficiencies of my own scientific education. Uh, I really try to uh, show students that science is a living, breathing thing that, that, that evolves, that that's changes, and it's just this process 
by which we try to address what goes on in the natural world. And it's not so much uh, a litany of facts. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of my students uh, in, in, in college show up with that belief that science is a litany of facts, I think because that's what they've been taught, unfortunately, often in high school and, and in grade school.